and welcome to Zeke in Action, a Radius Spicy Analyzer. My name is Keith Jones. I'm a security researcher at Corelight. Uh, first couple things. One is you're going to see a bunch of URLs and stuff throughout my slides here. Don't uh, screen capture in a frenzy or anything like that. I'm going to try to release my slides uh, so that way you can click into them because um, a lot of the stuff is like documentation and so forth that you're going to um, want to use uh, after I hopefully uh, after I teach you how to go through this process. The other thing is uh, you're probably looking at this and you're thinking spicy or I'm sorry radius. Why is he doing a spicy radius uh, protocol analyzer, not another one? Since radius is already inside Zeke's core uh, source code. Well, the reason is this radius is a generally simple protocol that I can show you. Uh, from A to Z, how to start uh, with nothing and how to you know pull the RFC and um, put some simple constructs together to pull the information that you want. Uh, if we did a more complicated protocol um, that wasn't supported by Zeek, uh, you'd probably get stuck on some of the more um, complex things in Spicy. And what I hope to do later on is release another video on the more difficult parsing. Uh, constructs or you know how you, how you can parse more difficult protocols with spicy uh, after we get the basics in this video um, under our belt so in this presentation I'm going to talk about a process that I've used and what I've done is you know I've tried to encapsulate what I've done for several open source protocol analyzers into a generic process that you can follow for any protocol and for demonstrate for you know presentation purposes we're just going to put radius in there now some of this uh, some of the other open source releases that I've used this process on are listed on your slides here there's the facefish rootkit protocol anal analyzer that I wrote I wrote a IPsec protocol analyzer and that's um, Far more complex than the one that you'll you'll be seeing here. So if you want to see uh, more how Spicy works or how it looks on more complex uh, protocols, that's one that I recommend going to look at. Uh, OpenVPN I wrote um, that's not as complex as IPsec. That's um, still more complex than than Radius though. Uh, OSPF is actually a packet analyzer instead of a protocol analyzer because it rides on top of IP instead of TCP or UDP. So it's slightly different, and um, I'm not even going to touch on packet analyzers in this presentation. Hopefully I can re uh, record a video like this for packet analyzers later on. And that's OSPF, but I also released uh, STUN, which is a NAT traversal protocol, and then there's the WireGuard VPN um, that also has tail scale WireGuard offshoot in it. And then I've also used this process on several closed source protocol analyzers that I just haven't released to open source yet. Here's the outline. Now I'm going to walk through each step right now just very quickly, uh, 30,000 foot view. Uh, each one of these steps is going to have its own slide and I'm going to talk about it and almost all of them have an actual demonstration where you're going to see you know, commands on my system. Uh, when I say system, first of all, I should say uh, I'm using a MacBook here, so everything you're going to see is on the Mac operating system. If you're using Linux, it's going to be very similar, but little things are going to be different. So I'm not going to demo how to install Zeek and Spicy. I'm going to talk about how I do it on the Mac, and it's uh, pretty simple to do on a Mac. Uh, there are other ways, there are other simple ways of doing it on Linux and so forth. So all you need to do is just go to the instructions that I point throughout my presentation and look up, you know, how to install Zeek on Linux or how to install Spicy on Linux. And uh, the instructions will walk you through that. And then once we get into installing ZKG, now we're sort of system independent at that point, And I'm going to start showing you some demos from that point forward. So I'm going to talk about this outline uh, very generically, and then we're going to drill down on each one of them um, with you know in a portion of the video later on 
So the first step is just going to be installing our prerequisites. It's going to be Zeek, Spicy, and ZKG. Hopefully, the majority of you that are coming into this video have probably got these three already set up. Then we're going to install something. Well, you might not have Spicy set up, but you have the other two set up. <clears throat> Once you have Spicy set on your system, you can install the Spicy plugin. And what this does is let Zeek talk to Spicy. And then we're going to install, um, well, we're going to create a package with ZKG create, and that's going to put a whole framework around some actual working code for us. That all we have to do is go in and start editing um, very small increments at a time to start supporting our protocol. And the reason why we're, we're able to do small increments at a time and we're able to do it very quickly is because in step four, we're going to go out and find some PCAPs. And I know this is a really boring step, but it's just part of research. And it, sometimes it's the, it's, you know, the linchpin that have, it holds everything up. You know, so if, if you don't find a PCAP, sometimes you can't go any further than writing a protocol analyzer. So I'm going to show you how some tricks that I find uh, going out there looking for PCAPs. And then once you have your PCAP, I'm going to show you how to set up a test with a PCAP. So once we set up our test, that's going to let us <clears throat> create a log. And then um, from there, we can then just, you know, increment our um, protocol analyzer. So in step six, we're going to go out and find the RFC. Uh, most of the protocols will have an RFC unless it's like a, pro a proprietary protocol. Um, I've had to go to company websites to download protocol specifications before. Um, if you're one of the unlucky bunch that are trying to implement a protocol that doesn't have an RFC or publicly shared information, that's kind of a hard spot to be in. Um, there's some tricks and so forth. I'm going to show you how to um, how to tackle protocols incrementally. So we're basically like not parsing anything and just then going and parsing out little things that we want at a time. And you can kind of apply that to protocols you don't have specs for, but you might know a little bit of information about just by, say, having access to PCAPs and so forth. Uh, but that's that's a tangent. Um, here we're going to stay very basic. We're going to talk about um, Radius does have an RFC. We're going to pull the RFC. I'm going to show you, um, you know, how to read through that RFC and decipher some information enough to the point where you can write some spicy code, which is step seven. Once you finish with step seven, um, our case, we're going to um, open source this. So the link is there on the right. We're going to push it to GitHub. And once it's pushed up to GitHub, I'm going to show you that uh, it's not that hard to register it with packages.zeek.org, and that lets people find it if they go to the website and do a search, or if they just use ZKG. It makes it very, very easy for them to install, and I recommend if you're open sourcing anything, push it into there so people can find it. And then because I could not end at step nine, we're happy because hopefully this is all successful. We're going to rejoice. All right, so I'm going to talk about four different layers here um, <clears throat> to what constitutes spicy. All right, the first layer everybody should know, um, pretty much everybody should know coming into this video is Zeek. You need Zeek. We're talking about Zeek. It's what we use. So you're going to need the Zeek program. That's the first layer. Second one is spicy. If I just say spicy, usually I mean this layer, and this is the layer that takes your spicy language source code files and compiles them into working protocol analyzers. I like to think of this as GCC for spicy code or G++ for spicy code. Now, once you compile spicy code in the second layer, you need the first layer to be able to understand it. So natively, Zeek just can't pick up compiled spicy code and go, oh, this is a protocol analyzer, and use it. That is the job of Spicy Plugin. So there's a plugin that plugs into Zeek called Spicy Plugin that when you give Zeek Spicy code that's compiled in Layer 2, it allows Zeek to understand it. All right, so if you're with me so far, we've talked about Layers 1, Zeek. Layer 2, Spicy, which is, this is the compilation tool chain. Layer 3, Spicy Plugin, which lets Zeek and Spicy talk. 
we're going to be spending our time coding in layer number four on the bottom, which is your protocol analyzer. So <clears throat> once we have layers one, two, three working, we can write spicy code, which is our protocol analyzer, and let the three layers on the slide deal with it from there. So as we get to our first demo, um, I'm going to be mostly talking about the first three layers, you know, setting up Zeek, Spicy, a Spicy plugin, and then we're going to create the template for step number four, which is our protocol analyzer in, our, in the, the next step. This is going to be one of those things that I'm not going to explicitly demo for you on my system because I've had Zeek installed for a long time and brew installed a long time and I know if I uninstall it and try to install it just for these purposes something will mess up and I'll be <laughs> I'll have to go back to work and I need a working system so <clears throat> I'm going to talk through what I did which is on my Mac book I used homebrew which is in the first link homebrew is a package manager one of the packages is the Zeek package and the formula for uh, the Zeek package to homebrew is in that second link. The command on my system once I have brew installed is very, very simple. I just type brew install Zeek. And that goes out there and it pulls down a pre-compiled version of Zeek and installs it. So it's really quick in comparison to, say, trying to uh, compile Zeek yourself. You can do the same thing with Spicy. There's the link. Um, with the information inside the, the spicy documentation, how you do this. But I pulled out the commands, put it on the slide for you. Um, what you got to do is you got to open a tap, and it's the Zeek tap. So you just say brew tap Zeek slash Zeek. And once that's once you run that, a new tap is available, which means there's new uh, packages for, that you can install. One of them is spicy. So now you're able to run the second command, which is brew install spicy. And if you've ever tried to compile spicy, or even Zeek in the last step, both of them take a while. So when you run this and it takes, you know, maybe a minute or so to download it and install it, it's, it saves so much time. I can't recommend it more. And the, the only reason why you wouldn't have to use Homebrew on a Mac book or even pre-compiled pre binaries on a Linux system is, um, you know, if you were going to edit Zeek core source code, yeah, you need the development version. You need to compile it. Or same thing if you have to do the spicy tool chain. But what I'm teaching here, and 100% and of my job lately, has been just making protocol analyzers on up. So we can just go out and get compiled versions of this and make it very quick. And that's one of the benefits of um, using spicy. All right, so the demo I'm going to jump in about here on my system, which is installing um, a new virtual environment for Python, and then um, um, running or installing ZKG. And then once we have ZKG installed, I'm going to, uh, so <laughs> when I put a command in red, like the fourth command on down, this means um, that I've had trouble with it. So once we install ZKG, if you don't correctly set your environment variables on your MacBook, you could accidentally install ZK, your, your Zeek packages in places you don't intend. So if something funky starts happening with regard to your packages, a lot of times it's because this command wasn't run and I, so many times have messed up my system because I haven't run this command first before I use my ZKG. So that's why I put it in red there. So let me walk through the slide one more time and I want to highlight this. You're going to have Python. In my, <clears throat> in my case, I already have Python installed. I'm not going to reinstall it because, um, you know, it, I, if I uninstall it or reinstall it, it's probably going to break my system for the purposes of the demo. So um, also, MacBooks have changed over time, and I believe it switched Python 2 to Python 3, and it depends on where you get your Python. Me, I got it from Homebrew, which was the same um, package installer that we talked about previously, and I, it's just called Python 3 on my system. So that's the command you have here. 
The next one is going to be sourcing. And once you source the um, virtual environment activate file that was created, you're now in this new virtual environment um, that you created in the previous step. Now, the next step, what I do is I pip install ZKG. And what that does is it goes out and gets ZKG and it installs it into my virtual environment. So that way, if anything messes up, I can wipe out my virtual environment and start from scratch. And I'm assured that I'm not gonna you know, mess with anybody else's installed packages on the system too. And even for myself, if I have different projects, I can use different virtual environments. All right. Um, and then uh, you run the eval command. And the eval command with a ZKG and env, those are backticks, by the way, which is next to the one key. And what that does is it sets vi environment variables that come out of the ZKG environment command. And that does things like, you know, points to directories of where things are going to get installed. If you've never used ZKG before, um, you run the ZKG auto config command. And what that does is it sets up all that template information about, you know, I'm running ZKG, but I don't have any packages installed yet and so forth. So basically, so the ZKG command works for you. All right, I hope that was clear enough. Step number two, um, installing the SPICY plugin. If you have ZKG installed, and a lot of you probably do at this point, uh, just coming into the video, um, all you have to do is type ZKG install SPICY plugin. Granted, you also have to have SPICY installed, so you'd have it installed from Homebrew earlier. Once that happens, if it's it's going to chug for a while, it's going to pull down, it's going to do some compilations, it's going to be a pretty large um, plugin. So that's why I put the dot 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 there, is just to signify that you know some stuff's going to happen. Once it's all done and you get a command prompt back, if you type Zeke dash uppercase N twice, underscore once, uppercase Z for Zeke, colon, colon, uppercase S for spicy, it spits out spicy information for you. So this is a test command. If you run this and you get an error, that means spicy plugin didn't install. And spicy plugin might not have installed because of a lot of different reasons. It could be because, um, you know, spicy isn't correctly installed on your system. Usually that's the most um, probable reason is spicy isn't on your system. So once you put spicy on your system, then you're able to then put spicy plugin on your system. And once you put spicy plugin on your system, you're able to run the command at the bottom and you're able to see spicy output. So when spicy plugin is actually there, you're able to see some um, sort of like global variable type of information. Um, so you're only going to get one of two inform two things as output, an, an obvious error, or you're going to get some information about spicy. If you get information about spicy, that means things were installed and you're good to go. And then we will move on to the next demo after that. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to a new video and uh, give you a shot of my system and show you how some of this stuff works. All right, here we are at one of my command prompts. What I'm going to do is I've already set up my Python virtual environment and installed ZKG. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate my virtual environment. If you haven't installed yours, um, there was a command with the Python dash M V E M V. Um, go ahead and run that and then you can start where I'm at. So I keep my Python in a slash Python slash three, and then there's bin activate. And when I source it, if then you can see the three on the left hand side of my command prompt there and that tells me now I'm using this virtual environment for Python 3. Um, I've already installed um, ZKG so if you didn't you could do a pip install dash uppercase you will do a upgrade even and ZKG at the end you press enter and it will um, pull it down and install it for you. All right once that's happened and you have ZKG installed, you then want to run the very important command eval backtick ZKG ENV backtick. And 
and that sets some important environment variables for you. And I wiped out all my packages. So uh, this is like the very first time I've ever used ZKG. So I'm going to run ZKG auto config. And that's going to set up some template type of information for you and say, all right, you're using ZKG, but you have zero packages installed. Now, this directory here, .zkg, that directory is where ZKG stores its information. So if when I mess things up really badly, I just delete that directory, and then I start from scratch. Just like you just saw, where I typed ZKG autoconfig, and it creates that directory, and it's empty. And then I start from scratch and install the packages that I need you know, for my development, and I go forward from there. Okay, so once you have ZKG installed, the next thing you're going to want to do is install Spicy Plugin. Now, the command for that was on the slide. It's just ZKG install Spicy dash plugin. And you press enter. And it says, do you want to install it? Yes, we do. Enter. Now, this is going to take a while. You can see my command um, kind of changing away there. It's going to run the unit test first, which if I know it's really working, I can use, sometimes I'll use the dash dash skip with, uh, or dash dash skip tests with the ZKG install command. Um, but since you're probably learning this for the first time and you may not have a working system, I would always run unit tests because this is the point where it's going to tell you if something um, horrible went awry while it was compiling. Once it finishes the unit test, then it's going to go through the installation process. And that's also going to take a long time. And you're going to see a bunch of dots across your screen. Once that's all done, it will then go to a command prompt. And what I'm going to do now is save you the, um, I don't know, 10 or so minutes it's going to take for this process on my machine. And pause this video and we will return once it is all done um, doing the heavy lifting. And we're back. You can see there it um, took a little bit. It did its uh, testing and then it did the installing and it says it's loaded. So in theory, once I go in here and type the command that I gave you on the slide, the Zeke dash uppercase N uppercase N underscore Zeke colon colon spicy we see we get spicy information back. So this means we're installed and everything is good. So if we were to hand Zeke spicy code now for a protocol analyzer, Zeke will know what to do with it. So we're now, we've got our prerequisites done. Welcome back. The next step, step number three, is going to be creating the package. And this command, um, what it does is it creates a template on your system that is more than just a template. It is a whole working protocol analyzer written by another Coralite employee that's, um, he works on um, uh, open source, uh, Benjamin Benier. And it's it's really awesome because it takes 80, 90% of the, the legwork and the problems out of the picture for you. So what you do is you run ZKG create and then dash dash package dir, and in my case here for our presentation, I'm going to do Zeek, so that way we know it's a Zeek package, dash spicy, <clears throat> dash radius. And what that does is it tells anybody, all right, well, if it's just a repo, I see it's a Zeek package with the Zeek on the front. The spicy in the middle says, all right, spicy is a requirement. It's not a, it's not something that the, the um, command lines or anything is going to tell you. It's just a visual requirement. Yes, spicy is a requirement, dash radius, and radius is the program that requires that requirement. So um, with that, what that does is it creates a package directory. Now, there's some Git stuff that happens in the background, and that's part of the reason why I have the Zeek on the front is so when we push this up to a GitHub repo, you know it's Zeek versus something else. All right, and the magic on this is the dash dash template argument 
and the argument is a long URL. And um, again, you can just copy these out of my slides. Uh, what that does is it pulls down Benjamin's um, template and it asks you a couple questions about what you're creating. And then based upon those questions, then fills out um, a, a directory with source code and its initial git commit. So you could just push it right up to a, um, a GitHub repository at that point. But we will do that. We'll do the pushing of the GitHub repository at the end since it's already a step. All right, so what we're going to do now is this demo time. I'm just going to run this command for you and I'm going to show you what it outputs. Welcome back. The first command we're going to type is the eval zkgm command. And once we type that, we can see that it gives us a command prompt back and says nothing. So hopefully ZKG is all set up now. So when we run this, the ZKG create command with the Zeke spicy radius directory and the template from Benjamin, it asks us for a namespace. So we do a Zeke underscore spicy underscore radius. It says a name. Now, if it's something like OSPF, I'd probably do all caps, OSPF. Uh, but since it's uh, more of a word like radius, what I do is just do radius. And it's done. So if we were to go in that directory, RPC, oh, not RPC, it's a uh, radius. And do it ls-al, you see there's a whole set of template in here that wasn't there before. So this is what gets pulled from Benjamin's repository and created for you. So um, we're going to move our uh, PCAPs into here, and we're going to be doing all our development in this directory. This is probably the least fun aspect of doing protocol analyzer development. It's going out and finding PCAPs that you can do development against. Um, there's different ways you can go, to about, go about it. Uh, usually what I do is I do an open source search first through Google. Um, and we'll do things like, you know, radius PCAP. Um, in this instance, we have radius. And radius is a well-used protocol, and it's um, supported by Wireshark. So if you just go to Wireshark's page and do a search for let me back up a second. If you go to Wireshark's sample captures page that I'll show you, um, you just go there through Google. If you type Wireshark sample captures, it's, it's the top hit. Once you go there, if you do a search uh, for radius, because we're doing radius, you're going to find there's a PCAP there. And I'm going to show you uh, in a second through our demo um, where you can get it and download it. Once you have that, you know, game over. You have a you have a PCAP, and you can um, start poking through it and analyze it. If Wireshark doesn't have it, um, a lot of times I'll just do Google. I'll do things like Radius PCAP in the search box, and hopefully find a site that'll have it. Now, if Google doesn't have it, you're kind of stuck. Um, really, the best option you have is setting up whatever protocol it is that you're trying to analyze and record it. So if it's a radius, you might have to set up a radius server and actually push some traffic across the network and do a TCP dump and grab it, which takes a long time, and it's not a fun process. So that's why you want to do the open source research first is to save you those hours of having to set up something like a radius server. So then once you get your PCAP, what do you do with it? Well, first thing I usually do is I just open it up in Wireshark and see if Wireshark supports it. In our case, radius does. So... We're going to just poke through some radius and see what it looks like uh, just to get our feet wet into what we'll be parsing soon. So with that, I'm going to switch over to a demo, which is going to show you like the web browser and the um, we'll take a look at what we download in Wireshark. All righty, so now you're looking at a web browser. So what I did is I opened Google and I just said Wireshark sample captures. And it led me to this page. I pressed a 
um, either Command F or Control F, depending on what system you're on, to do a search, type that in radius, and you see what you see on your page here. So uh, Wireshark has this um, for download. So we're just going to go ahead and click on Radius Localhost, and we're going to download it. Okay. And once it's finished the download, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to um, Wireshark and show you what that looks like once it's imported. And what I do on my Mac system is you just all you have to do is take that PCAP and just drag and drop it into your Wireshark and you're good to go. Yeah, my Wireshark application here. And you can see, um, in this case, Radius goes over UDP. Uh, I just had the first packet selected here. And you can drop down the protocol down here. And you see it's a fairly uh, simple protocol. We have a code that looks like it's about one byte. We have a packet identifier that was about one byte. A length that's about two. An authenticator is about 16. And a text item of 67, if I break this open. Uh, yes, we got attribute value pairs. This happens. I've seen this in protocols before. I'm just clicking through, opening some of these up and for the people that might just want to watch the video and not click through this on their desktop. But you can see what um, attribute value pairs are, st are interestingly stored uh, items where you have um, what type it is, like there. And then you have, and then... <clears throat> That tells you that tells a program how to interpret it, um, but then you have a length here, and then you can see uh, just the string Steve here. So, in this particular thing, in this particular tribute, we're seeing username of Steve down here. We have password. This thing says password encrypted of whatever this hash is. Let's see what else we got. Uh, here's an IP address. That's stored in actual bytes, not a string, but actual bytes. Uh, I got a port. Cool. So as you can see, there's some useful information in here. What we're going to want to do, so if we, if I can frame this, what our, our tasks are ahead of us, is we want to take these packets and make a log in Zeek based upon these packets. And to make a log, we have to figure out what columns we want in our logs. To figure out what columns we want in our logs, we have to figure out what we want to parse out of radius. So what we're going to do at this point is um, what I will probably do is pick some of these attribute value pairs and make them into columns, like probably the username. Uh, we won't log the password. We'll probably log the NAS IP address and port along with um, you know some of the other radius information like maybe the packet identifier and so forth um, along with the uh, connection information so we can tie it back to just the generic connection in the con dot log in Zeek and um, we'll try to make it pretty and useful so if you stick with me we will switch back to the slides and see what our next step is and continue on and try to make this a actual zeke log called radius.log all right our next step is to set up the tests with pcaps so we just downloaded pcap we're going to take that pcap we're going to put it in our traces directory and that's going to um, let us run our test over and over and over um, while we add different fields to um, our radius protocol structures. So the second step, you're going to then go in and delete any test you don't want, which is basically anything else but a basic test. And then we're going to delete all baselines. And the reason is we will always want our test to fail. And that is because when we run a test and the test fails, it then gives us the output. And the output is what we're developing. So if we add a little code, we run our tests, it fails, and it says, here's your output. We look at our output and say, you know, is this to our liking? If it is, sweet, we move on. If it's not, we go back and do the iterative process again over and over until finally we get a radius.log that we like. Um, so our last step is we're going to add a simple test 
to test analyzer for the new PCAP that we just downloaded. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to my editor, which in this case is uh, Visual Studio Code, and that'll let me point some things out for you there. So now we're looking at the um, project directory for the Zeek Spicy Radius package that we created. And you can see I opened some directories on the left-hand side there. Um, the test directory, and inside the test directory, there's another directory called Analyzer, where, which is where the tests go. And then there's a Traces directory, which is where we put our PCAP. So I already dragged and dropped the Radius localhost PCAP ng file that we downloaded earlier into here. Next, what I'm going to do is um, clean up the tests in here. Now, I recommend leaving the availability because that just checks and sees if our spicy analyzer is loaded. Um, it's just like the very first basic check, and it's important. So I leave that one as is. There's a parse.spicy down here. We won't be using this one, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Now, we're just going to set up one test with basic.zeek. If we read through it, I'm going to assume you have a little knowledge in um, Zeek tests, otherwise you're just go ahead and look up B tests and I'll give you more information on what I'm talking about. The first line says requires, okay, we want to test and make sure in the traces directory our new trace is there. So let's go ahead and make sure our file name is correct. Radius localhost dot bcap and g. Get rid of everything else. And next, what it'll execute, I'll put an uppercase C, little r, that doesn't worry about checksums, and then I want to make this file the same. Just to make sure we copy it. Okay, and then the next thing it says is do a difference on connection log. Well, we're going to be making a radius.log, so let's go ahead and put that in here too. All right. Test doc, test radius against Zeke with small trace. Yep, that's correct. Load analyzer, this is currently the one we're developing, so that's correct. Here, this is to do. So everywhere in this template directory where we need to change things or add data or logic and so forth, there's to do's. So this is just one of them. Um, I'm choosing not to put any information in here yet because I don't really have any information output. Uh, but if we had other events or so forth, we could put them in here and maybe do like print statements, and then that way it would go to standard output. Okay, so I saved off that file, and let me finish showing you a little bit around here. Um, the analyzer directory up here, this is where the meat of everything is. So you have your load Zeek files, you have your EVT files, you have your spicy files, you have your DPT SIG files, you have your uh, standard old Zeek file, your main.zeek file, and then you have uh, another spicy file. What I'm going to do is, in another step in our outline, and I'm going to talk through editing up these files and making them correct. But while I'm here, why don't we go ahead and edit our ZKG meta file? Because there's a to-do here and our summary, and we will call this a Zeek protocol analyzer for radius based on spicy. Copy this out. And replace this line with it. And save that. And that takes care of the ZKG meta file for us. Uh, one other thing I usually do too is I will create a readme file. Oh, that got stuck in the test directory. So what I'm going to do is just drag it out here. And here, I'm going to say seek spicy radius. And I say RFCs coming soon. Pcap source 
And then I try to give credit to whoever I steal PCAPs from, so that way their license files apply. Um, which is, let me see. Well, actually, that's a different window. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say coming soon here just for this video purpose. And then after I stop this video, I'll go find the URL that we downloaded that from, and I'll plug it right in here. So that way, when you look at this later, you'll know where you can get back to that PCAP file. All right, that should be it, and we'll move on to the next step. Thanks. So we have a PCAP, and we have test set up. We need to know how to parse up that PCAP, and that comes into some sort of documentation. Um, in our case for RADIUS, the documentation's RFCs, or Re Request for Comments, which is a public document that says this is what RADIUS is, and if you're a client or a server, this is what you should expect um, for the protocol to work properly. Um, so what I do is um, when I have something like RADIUS, is I'll open up Google and I'll search the phrase RADIUS protocol RFC. And you're going to see here in a, a demo in a minute, when I type that, the very first two that pop up are related to RADIUS. And we're going to go into those websites or, well, it's documents. Um, uh, through the web browser, and we're, I'm going to show you where you can start to pick apart some of these fields inside RADIUS. Okay, so over here I open up a web browser, and I typed in RADIUS protocol RFC. Very two top ones that pop up, RFC 2865 and 3579. 3579 looks like um, it has some, it's basically like some extensions uh, didn't look like when I looked through it that we would be probably using it in this presentation but I just wanted to point out that it is there um, in case you are interested um, but the main one we'll be looking at is 2865 so I went ahead and open that in another tab here I've looked at a lot of RFCs this is very very standard very standard you look down here, and usually there's you know some type of introduction, and then there's some filler stuff up front that just talks about stuff in general, uh, you know, like getting you um, up to the point of being able to understand the packets. And then there's going to be some section that'll say like on the wire format, packet format, representation format. There's something along those lines. Here they call it packet format. And if we actually do a little reconnaissance and look down the list here, we're going to see these are different types of attributes and stuff. So there's a lot of logic in here. We're, probably, we're not going to support all this. We're just going to pull out a couple things that are interesting, and we're going to put it in a log and uh, call it a day. And then uh, off, off the video, we can improve it with all the extra stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and go to packet format. All right, so it's UDP. If you uh, probably saw that in the table of contents, they talked about UDP. And just like when we looked at Wireshark, it's pretty simple. Here's the packet format. And again, this is very standard in how it's kind of drawn out. So if you've never seen this before, this ASCII art, it's very similar uh, when you look across all the different protocols and the publications. So. If you're ever in doubt in the table of contents you can't find your packets, usually what I do is I skim and look for ASCII art like this because that usually shows you where the packets are. Now, take that with a grain of salt. Not all protocols have this stuff. So I'm working on some protocols right now that are more represented by a language that actually kind of fits one-to-one -one with SPICY and doesn't have a packet drawn out like this. So if you do the quick search for the ASCII art, you won't find it in most cases. All right, so there's only a few fields that we really need to support here. There's a 8-bit field called code. There's another 8-bit field called identifier. Looks like a 16-bit field called length. Uh, looks like a big field called authenticator. If I remember right, they said it was 16 bytes. And then there's these attributes. So if you scroll down here, they actually give you um, explanations of all these things. So the code. A code can be basically an enum, so it could be a number, 
and the number means something. So what we're going to look at, I've already looked at the PCAP that we downloaded, and these type of packets, request, accept, reject, those will support. Uh, we, might we might support this access challenge, but the rest of these experimental and so forth, accounting, <clears throat> we're not going to support them in here. We're just going to show um, some examples and how to make a log and not draw this video out too long. Um, so I can tell you, though, that when we hit those types of packets, we still parse them. We just don't parse all the fields in them. And that's kind of what I do here is I go look at a PCAP and I say, oh, well, here's some interesting information. And I would like this in a log. And I kind of work backwards from there. And so I looked at the PCAP in this case and I said, all right, these, these attributes that we looked at earlier are, are things that I want to make into columns. Well, to do that, oh, I'm going to have to support access requests, accept and reject. And then, you know, that's how I went forward. So uh, that was my thinking on here. So that's going to be the result codes. Um, this identifier looks like it's a just an ID type thing. This authenticator was 16 bytes. And I'm just saying these out loud because when I switch videos over to my programming side, you won't be able to see this, but I will. Okay, and they, they break this down, the authenticator into stuff like this. Like, unless I can easily tell what it is, a lot of times I'll just parse it as the 16 bytes and not do anything with it. So I have the field in case I decide to do something later with it, but I might not be, you know, parsing it down even further if I don't have any use for it. And just looking through the PCAP, I didn't really see any, anything in there that I wanted to use the authenticator for. And they have a big administrative note. And then they get into packet types. And this is the access requests. And they show you the packet. And spoiler alert, all the packets are the same. We looked at the, the um, PCAP. And they all have the same header on it, and they all have um, the attribute value pairs. And that's what we want to support. But it's here in text that they wrote in June of 2002. So you have it. And here's the accept. Looks the same. The structure, basically for us, the structure for parsing reasons is, is the same. So this is just, this just explains it protocol wise because these RFCs do more than just tell us how to parse something on the wire. We use them to figure out how to parse something on the wire, but other people will use this to, so when they write a server or a client, they know exactly how to talk to that other server or client that they might not have written. So it's a lot of redundant information for our purposes. I'm just sk skimming through here so you've seen at least once. All right, so <clears throat> we get down to the attribute section and this is the attribute value pairs. And these are also very simple. You got a byte, that's the type. You've got the length of whatever the value is going to be, and that's in bytes. And then you got the actual value in bytes. And you're going to see that this stuff is really easy to parse out and spicy. So the type, you know, it explains in human words, but here's the enum. This is what we're sort of interested in. And you can see there's a lot of them. Okay. I have them all highlighted there for you. I'm telling you right now, we're not supporting all these. We're just going to support a couple, like username, uh, like IP address, just the things that you saw me po uh, point out in the PCAP and Wireshark earlier. Just enough to make a nice log that um, somebody can find useful. You know, these things we can parse, we can support all these things later. But a lot of times I, I like to have a purpose because I don't want to add extra logic on a network sensor that for, to parse something that I probably won't use. So that's my logic for doing that. So this is, you've now seen the pictures of the two different structures that we're going to be supporting. There's the radius structure and then there's the attribute value pair structure. Right now the screen is on the attribute value pair structure. So what we're going to do now is uh, move to the next step in our development process. So next, we've got our RFC, we've got our PCAP, we've got our test set up, 
we got our template, we got everything. All we have to do is write the code. And I can't really put this into a slide. This is one of those things that I'm going to walk you through. Um, so, And I'm talking out loud, so hopefully uh, you can hear some of my um, reasoning behind doing the uh, development that I do. But in this slide, I want to put a bunch of useful links for you because I usually I keep these open all the time. Um, the first one is the spicy documentation. I mean, that has everything from the second bullet, which is the programming reference, uh, down to you know the spicy and Zeek integration. And I pulled those links out so you'd have them quick there for you. The other one I keep open all the time is Zeek types, just because I'm developing between two different languages. My mind gets confused all the time between the types. One's bytes, one's strings, one's vectors, and it's just hard to remember what, what you're using where. So I put all these links out there for you. Um, I usually keep these in open tabs. You're going to see me in the demo. We're going to walk through uh, doing some of the source code, and um, you're not going to see these open because I only can screen record one thing at a time here. So um, what you're going to do is, if you're interested, uh, while I'm talking, you can open these, um, and again, when I'm when I'm coding, I already have them open because I have like eight different things open <laughs> that I'm referring to just to make the uh, spicy source code that you're going to see. So let's switch over to our uh, Visual Studio code now. Okay, one of the things I want to show you was I did add the PCAP source to the README here. Oh, one of the things we can do now too is add our RFC. We have the second one, but we probably won't use it in this video. I'll put it in here. Okay. And I also manually added a get ignore file. This is just a, you know, it gets rid of like your Apple browser files and ignores your build directories and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> and I can't remember if I did it in a previous video, but if I didn't, I just wanted to point out that my baseline directory is now empty. Um, I know I at one point had to delete the baselines in here, and my analyzer directory just had, my test analyzer directory just has my availability check and that basic check that we did earlier. So, if we did nothing else and just left all this logic up here as default, we should be able to create the plugin and then run the tests. And you do that by creating this build directory and just by you know doing a make dir, you go into that directory, it's empty, you do a cmake space dot dot, and what that does is it configures from the parent directory up, which is this is the one up directory. And once it configures, you do a cmake space dash dash build space dot. And that then does the compilation process. So this I've already done that here. You can see my build directory is actually full of stuff. I leave that in one command prompt. Now I open a new command prompt. Remember to do the eval zkg env command when you do a new command prompt because that has burned me a few times. <clears throat> I then go into the test directory over there, and then I type btest. And when that happens, I'm going to do it for you now. Your tests fail because we don't have any baselines. And now we have this temp directory. And this analyzer basic, which failed, we got a whole bunch of logs. Let me walk you through some of these logs. Usually when I come into a failed test, I first go to the standard error. There's nothing in here, but a lot of times when things go horribly awry, this is full of stuff. So it's usually the first one I check. Second one I check is Diag, because that tells you why things have failed. And up here it says, oh, you've got this file, but there's no baseline. Okay, well, no baseline, I understand that. Um, 
we haven't made baselines. We deleted it. That's why it's failing. But then I start looking at this file, and I'm thinking, well, what is this? And I look, and it says path radius. And I say, huh? And then I go down here, and I go, oh, we got a radius log. That's strange. And it paused for a minute. And I realized we talked about, um, I believe in a video up front, that radius is in core Zeek. So it's little things like this that'll throw me for a loop. So we have a Zeek log. Um, but we're running a spicy radius parser, so we do not want this anymore. So what's happening is radius, the old radius is making a log. We're not going to attempt to follow this output one for one. Um, that's not the purpose of this video. And once this video is done and we have sort of a base package, once our out, once our spicy radius works at a basic level, we can then try to match it um, one for one to the log and the events and all that stuff for the core, for for the core Zeek, the, the one that's making the log that you're seeing right here. So, you know, we can do that later on. I'm not going to do it in this video, and I probably won't do it right after the video either because, you know, it takes some work, but it can be done. So that's the reason why it's failing. Um, you can see in here it records the standard error, records the standard out, both of them are blank. Um, it's, it records this, the script that you created, but it also records the actual logs. So con.log, you know, that's the whole thing. It's not it's not like going in and looking at your baselines where some of this stuff is different. This is the actual log. So you could flip through here um, just like Zeke ran on something. And so you go and you change your spicy analyzer up in the logic and then you run your tests which fail and then you get your outputs and then you check your output and you go oh okay you know maybe this thing isn't the way i want it to be and then you go back and you change your logic you run it again you check your output and you keep doing that iteratively until you exa get exactly where you want it and then you say oh okay well that's great and then you generate your baselines and you're done here in case you're curious i'm going to scroll over you see it does pop up as radius now, I don't know what a good time to tell you is, besides just telling you now. So this is the service that everything's popping up as radius. In the core, it just says radius. If there wasn't a core version of radius and we made a spicy version of radius, it would then be called spicy underscore radius. Okay. If... <laughs> There is a core version of radius, and we make a spicy version of radius, and then we replace the core version of radius with the spicy version of radius, which is a actual, it's something you can do in the spicy language, then it shows up as radius. So this shouldn't change for us, even though we're going from core radius to spicy radius, because we're replacing it. If we didn't have a something that we were replacing, this would be blank right now because it wouldn't detect it as something. And then later on, what it would happen is it would be populated with spicy underscore radius because there's a new spicy one, but there wasn't a core one that it replaced, if that makes any sense. Okay, and if I just move on, there's a uh, another radius log down here. So this is the actual log if you wanted to see it. Okay. And you can see in here, you know, I'm going to hit some of these things. Let's like, let's try to pull out the username. Um, it looked like there's some, uh, like an address we can pull out. Um, we'll try to get that. And it looks like it has a result. So we'll try to log the result as well. And that'll probably be good for our first stab is just get a couple columns. And these, if you recall, these come out of the those attribute value pairs that we looked at back in the PCAP. So we're basically, while we're parsing the attribute value pairs, we'll have to watch for them. And once we see one, we record it on the connection record 
And then we then take that information once the connection's done and we write it to a log. All right, so uh, finishing down, so that's the test. So I'm gonna pause the video here because I've had a good run on this video and um, I'm gonna take a little break and then I'll come back and walk you through a little more of this. Okay, so a little earlier, earlier I was telling you about the build directory. I wanted to show you what that looked like. So let me go ahead and make it. I, I deleted what I showed you earlier, so I'm gonna start from scratch just to show you what the process looked like. So I'm gonna make the directory build. Okay, I'm gonna go into it now. You can see it's empty. What I do is a cmake dot dot, so that then configures using the information in the parent directory. And now I do a cmake dash dash build in this directory, and it chugs away. And it's going to take a little bit. So there you go. All right, so I built the target radius. Now, in my other tab over here, I have the test directory open. And then remember, I ran the eval and all that stuff, so I just run btest. And when you run btest, you should always get the failure on the basic because we deleted the baselines. So when all that magic was going on in Visual Studio and you saw directories popping up and I was talking about running CMake commands and all that stuff, this is what it looked like behind the scenes. So we'll continue on in our uh, code. And uh, when I say I, I'm going to run the test, this is the process that I'm going to keep doing over and over and over. I'm just not going to show you it because I will come over to this, run the build. OK, it's very quick because we didn't change anything. Come over here, run the B test. And now my temp directory has all new information on my failure. So I keep my visual code direct uh, open, and then I keep these two um, consoles open. And I basically, between those three, do some changes on my editor, come to one, build it, go to the other one, um, test it, and then I go back to my editor, look at the dot temp, and see if it's the way I want it. And I just keep iterating over and over and over. So. Hopefully we'll take some of that pain out of there for you and we'll, we'll uh, uh, basically speed up the video and, and just get the code in there for you and we'll, we'll see what that looks like. All right, we're back in our editor here. <clears throat> Usually the first file I change is the analyzer.evt file. Um, you're going to see when you open it, there's some to-do information. I'm just going to go ahead and delete it in here. Um, it's the same. It's the template that makes this to-do uh, if you wanted to read it. You'll have to bear with me. Things are slow because I'm, I've got windows open and I'm recording in this one and it's just a little clunky. So, All right, so the very first up here, this portion sets up your analyzer. So we're going to do protocol, analyzer, spicy radius, over TCP. Well, we know it's UDP, so let's change this. Parse with Zeek spicy radius. Now, this is what we set up with through Zeek create. See that looks familiar? That also looks familiar through Zeek create. That's the purpose. Now, you could let Zeek parse by port. I typically don't unless there's no other reason I can't make a signature for it. If you can make a signature for the traffic, you can then let it try to detect through um, dynamic protocol detection, DPD signatures, um, on any port, which is what I try to do when I write a protocol analyzer. So I'm going to get rid of this. So all we're doing is setting up a radius server over UDP Parse with Zeek spicy radius, radius. Okay, now down here you see a to do. It says connect spicy side events with Zeek side events. This here is where we take a Zeek, I'm sorry, a spicy structure. And when that spicy structure is parsed, we raise an event on the Zeek side. 
this is the glue right here. And sometimes, I don't know if we'll run into the error in this video, but if you see glue error, a lot of times it's in this area, is the EVT file. So if you see the word glue, it usually means this. So I'm gonna get rid of this to-do, just to be clean, and save this file. Okay. Now, I was talking about DPD signatures. You have to bear with me. I kind of code and talk out loud and we'll kind of move all over the place while I show you different things that I've learned over the past, I don't know, eight or so months of learning this. <clears throat> but one of the first things I want to show you is this load. This is, if you know it from the Zeek side, when you load a module, this says load signatures called dpd.sig, which was created by our template. This file was also created by our template. And then load main.zeek. And if you recall, that's empty. See, it's empty. And I'll go ahead and get rid of the to-do even because we will come in there and clean it up shortly. Okay. So if we open the dpd.sig, this is what it looks like. And it says we use this to attach our protocol analyzer to a connection through signatures. So all I'm doing is just getting rid of the comments. Um, you can pretty much leave the name up here. You'll see one problem here is TCP should be UDP. And then next is our regular expression. Well, let me go ahead and put a regular expression in here. Let's see. Um, with, from what I recall, going outbound, um, we've got a access request, which would make a radius code of zero one. So we should hit be looking for a byte of zero one going outbound. Well, I say outbound, I didn't totally mean outbound, I guess coming from the client. Okay. Now, what I want to do is copy this. Put server. We're going to make this two-sided. So the client has to have a access request. The server has to have not an access request. It has to have access accept or an access reject or an access challenge based upon the PCAP that I've seen. And then I have to look up something real fast here with uh, Zeek signatures. So I'm going to the Zeek signatures page off video. And there's a requires reverse signature. That's what I was looking for. So we're going to put requires reverse signature. This guy. And if that happens, we're going to enable radius. But we see it's also enabled up here. We're not going to do that. So what has to happen is Zeek has to come into the signatures. It has to match on this first one that says access request on the first byte. And then on the other side of the connection, it has to either be an accept, reject, or access challenge. So you can kind of think of these payloads and so forth as signatures. I'm not saying this is the best signature. This is what we're going to work with here in the PCAP realm of things. Um, once I get this, you know, this video is done and I put this on real networks and I really test it, I might see some false positives out there where you'll see me come in and, you know, make this payload a little more strict. But for the purposes of developing off a of PCAP, we're going to make this as simple as possible. So we take out all the variables. And then once we load it on, 
live networks, that's when we start getting rid of false positives and making things more complex. But that won't be in this video. All right, we'll save this guy. All right, what do I want to go next? I went to EBT file. Everything else in here we can leave pretty much boilerplate as is. Um, let's go to the Zeek analyzer file here. This is important. This is the file that sets up the protocol call confirmation and rejection. So what we want to do is say anytime we parse Okay, so what this is saying is on the spicy radius structure, when it's done parsing, if it if done means it it, it completed correctly, we will confirm the protocol. That's very important. Without this line, our con dot log will never say radius, even if it thinks it's radius, because this is this is what makes that happen. So on the other side of things, if there's an error. We want it to say an error. So this is like a DPD error where you're going to see um, this pop out in your logs. So what this says is on the spicy radius structure, if we're parsing and we somehow run into an error, reject the protocol, meaning don't put it in our conduct log, and also make an, a mark in the error log that says we got an issue parsing. And it'll, and <clears throat> it'll tell you where things happen in the code when you do this. So it makes it very nice for you. So that leaves the meat of what we have to code in this file. So I'm going to go ahead and take a little break here just to capture the video and take a little uh, rest. And then I will jump back in and we will code this file up. This is the analyzer.spicy and this will be all our structures. So you're going to see most of our work done here. Oh, well, before I start, let's go ahead and take away the to-do because... We are no longer to do. So, see you in a few. All right, let's go in and finish some of this code. I'm not. I, I'm going to assume you have some spicy knowledge here because I can't um, describe everything, but um, I'll try to describe as much as possible. And again, if it's not clear, go ahead and hit me on um, the Slack, the Zeke Slack server under Spicy Channel. So here. Uh, this is the top level spicy uh, structure. So remember earlier in our EVT file, we, um, well, I'll show you. We said, this is our analyzer name. So when on the Zeek side, when we see spicy underscore radius, it comes from this here, what I just highlighted. And then this tells it what to parse with on spicy side. So this says um, in the Zeke spicy radius spicy module use the radius unit. And this back here is the radius unit. And the line four here, <clears throat> what this does is it gives you something easy to work with where it says, okay, um, I want to swallow up all the bytes and the ampersand EOD says until the end of data. So that line says the field name is payload. It's of type just raw bytes until the end of data. So once we attach this radius unit to our to the connection, it's going to swallow up everything. So we're, we're starting at a point where it's already parsing everything. It's just not giving us the fields yet. It's not giving us our radius fields. So what we're going to do, if you can just imagine with me for a second, is we're going to add a field one. Then we're going to add a field two. Then we're going to add a field three. And you notice our payload's not actually changing. And the reason why is it's just going to swallow up everything that's there. And we're only parsing the things out of radius that we really care about. And when you leave a payload bytes EOD like this at the end, and it swallows up the rest of the data in UDP, 
Um, you can kind of build iteratively like this, and you don't have to parse everything, and it makes your life a lot easier. Because there's just things in there that are protocol things that a lot of times you just don't care about, and you're not going to log. So we want to take these lines out so it doesn't cause us an error later on. One other thing I wanted to come back to was this, and I've got to look up real fast in the spicy documentation. There is, I want to get the, the exact language right so we don't have another error. It's a replaces, okay. So it should be, there's another line we're gonna to add to our analyzer here. And it's gonna be, I don't think I have I'll have to double check that. Replaces, and it should be just uh, radius, I believe. All right, just double checking the um, documentation over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back. Uh, I'm going to go double. I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to double check the the uh, documentation, and if it's a problem, I'll fix this up, and then I'll restart the video, and we'll continue. All right, see you in a second. A couple of changes. One is I needed a comma after that phrase, and the other is I'm going to make this uppercase just to be safe. Not sure if the lowercase will work well. <clears throat> All right. And with that, let's go ahead and move back to the file where the meat of our parsing will happen. Okay, so you'll remember from, and I have to move off screen to get my references so I can show you correctly that our first field is called code so I name it code it's a uint 8 okay and not only is a uint 8 but it's a special kind of uint 8 in that we have it's an enum in that we can actually enumerate some of these um, we can enumerate the code and make our, our source code a lot easier to read. So let's go ahead and convert it to, we'll call it code type. And then we just send our input in. But now we have to make our enum. And I'm just referencing some code over here. Type code type equals enum and then we've got possible values are sorry I'm flipping through a couple windows here So we've got um, access request equals one, access accept equals two, access Reject equals three. Access, nope, I'm sorry, accounting. It's four. Accounting response equals five. What else do we have? We have access challenge equals 11. 
status server equals 12. Status client equals 13. And then there's a reserved. Sometimes I put this in, sometimes I don't. I'll just put it in to this time. All right, let me double check. It looks like everything looks good. One, two, three, four, five, eleven, one. Yep. Okay. So now what this does is it says parse a one byte unsigned integer. But after you parse it, take the input, send it through code type, make it an enum. So this actually ends up being an enum. So we can actually refer to things as like access request and access accept. Plus, if we come in and we say public type, now we can actually use this type for that field inside Zeek, like it's an enum. So that's what public does on enums. Public on <clears throat> units um, allow you to attach it to the parser, if I'm remembering correctly from the documentation. Okay, so that was all we needed for our first field. Next, we have our identifier field. I'll just call it ID. It's a uint8. And that's just, that's literally just a uint8. We can't do any conversion on it. This next one is length. And that's going to be a uint16. And then we have authenticator. I'm just going to call it auth. And it was bytes. And we knew exactly how many bytes it was. It was 16. And then we have attributes after that. And I'm just looking at the RFC that we were discussing earlier in the video. So since I'm actually not parsing up the attributes because that's a little more complicated, and I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna take you through this in iterative steps, okay? So these were very easy things that I could parse right now. Code ID, length, and auth. So what I'm gonna do is just use those fields. We're going to get those fields into a log, and we're going to do the pipe, you know, wipe the piping all the way through the Zeek side, so we get a, a radius dot log. Once we do that, we'll come back in and we'll parse up the um, attribute value pairs, because that's a little deeper into the uh, packet, and you'll see it's really easy to sort of attach it on the Zeek side, and we'll attach it to the log real quick. And we should be done. So I take a little break here to prep the next section, and we'll see you in a bit. All right, off screen, I took out self payload on the bottom here. This, <clears throat> if you recall, links the spicy radius structure or the unit to the Zeek uh, event. And this event is in the Zeek radius namespace and it's the message is called or the events called message what we're going to do is send self of the radius that's parsed we're going to pick out the field called code and that's going to be the third argument to the message in zeek and then the fourth argument is going to be id which also came out of the radius so let me just show you that again what we're doing is we're sending this guy to Zeek, and we're also sending this guy to Zeek. Yes, we do. We have more stuff down here, but we're just going to send these two for now. And we just do that by plugging it in um, in here in this linkage and the glue. <clears throat> okay, and then off screen, I wrote a lot of structure to the main.zeek and it looks like it's a lot more than I actually wrote. A lot of this is just boilerplate stuff that you write with most any type of package that you write. I'm going to walk through it line by line and show you what I wrote and it's actually not that complicated despite it having a bunch of lines. Okay, so first of all, we replace the radius 
analyzer, so we're able to call this radius. Now we're going to start our export section. And in our export section, we're going to have a radius log. For a radius log, we need an info record. So we create one here. And we it's a very um, simple one. Just It's just information out of the connection record. Just the timestamp, user, not the user ID, the uh, UID for the connection, the uh, ID, so um, origin response of the IPs and so forth and ports, and then the protocol. Okay. <clears throat> when we do that, we're just going to get some minimal information out, but that's fine. We're going to build on that. That's the whole point of having the testing framework the way that I showed you is we can just add field upon field very quickly and very easily. Okay, so to come down here, um, I just made a global um, definition of the, um, the message event that we set up in the glue file, the EVT file. And if you look, the code is actually that enum. Remember I said it makes it a little easier so you can read it? And then the ID is just a straight up count. Now here, I'm going to make a log event. And the reason why we have a log event is because when you send information to a log, you can actually hook it. And you can imagine that that will be interesting in um, situations where you don't want to go through and do the same type of computations, but you want the information that goes into the log, but you don't want to have to open a log. You can just watch this event and you get all the information that goes to the log as it goes to the log. So I usually set these up on my protocol analyzers just to make it easy on people. Okay, and we need to save information on a connection. So this looks very familiar from other packages we've, we've written where we just extend um, the connection with something called spicy underscore radius and then I used the radius info above. Now I did try this without the spicy underscore and it did not work. I think it's because this is in, radius is defined in the core portion of Zeek and there was a conflict in there so I just put spicy underscore on this and it took care of that error. Now, if you remember, there's these different codes. I actually coded them up so we have an input of this big, long enum type, and then we get an output of a smaller string. So that way, the smaller string can go in a log, and it's not as ugly as putting a long line like this for every... <clears throat> I'm sorry, a long column like this for every line. Okay. And then this, if you've ever written packages and plugins, this is very familiar where you write a set session and it creates the spicy radius that we defined earlier. And all I do is I populate it with the connection, like the very default connection stuff. All right. And then we come down here and we handle, this is getting to be the meat of things. Uh, we handle the radius message and get everything lined up. That looks like our um, declaration above. So now, you know, here's how we're going to handle it. So we have our connection, it's ridge, that looks very familiar. But now with our uh, radius specific information, we have our code and our ID. So all I do is I set a session. And you'll see why in a minute with this connection state remove. And then for just for debugging purposes for right now, I don't do this all the time. I just do this while I'm developing. I just do a print statement, print out important information, which would be our arguments, for instance, and the fact that this is a radius message. So that way I can see it in my standard out that, oh, yeah, this is working. Now, on connection remove, that's when I log. And it basically it looks for the spicy radius um, information which we set here, which means we set it whenever we saw a radius message. And all it does is it takes that <coughs> uh, variable and it outputs it to the log. And then down here is very much boilerplate information or boilerplate um, logic for setting up your logging. 
that is it. I'm going to go ahead and um, compile, and then I will execute the B test, and that will populate uh, the dot temp directory. Okay, B tests are running now. All right. We open this up, we see a radius.log, but first thing we do is we check standard error. Hey, hey, look at that. That was why I wrote all the lines in just the basic structures. A, so you didn't have to wait all the time to see me type it, and B, so we didn't have a bunch of lines here the very first time out. <clears throat> so now, you know, we don't have any errors, so we should be able to look in our con.log, and we do see radius. I remember earlier when I said we use replace, it actually doesn't say spicy radius, it says radius because it does the replacement. So we see radius, and then we see a radius.log down here. And this looks like what it should. We have basic connection information. So what we need to do is basically add columns on here. You see I don't have the code or the ID in here yet. I just have the connection information. So I'm gonna pause the video. Um, take a little break here and then come back and what we're going to do is add the code and the ID to the radius.log and um, continue on with parsing up the protocol. So let's go ahead and get the code and the ID in our log and you'll see how um, this iterative process makes things really easy. <clears throat> so what we need to do is we see code and ID have been cut up with the analyzer, so it's actual, these are fields now in Spicy. You see they're being passed to the message, which then gets passed through the message event, all the way to where the event is handled. Problem is, is we don't have anything that takes this code and ID and puts them into uh, the log output, and we don't have uh, the columns in the log themselves. So let's add the columns to the logs first. We see ID is just a count. That's going to be easy. Code is this funky enumeration. So instead of doing a nice big output of it's going to have the namespace of that namespace you see there and code type, it's going to be really long. I made this cheater table. So that way, we can just do a lookup instead of having this long string, it pops out the smaller string. So what we can do is set up a log that has code, string, and ID of count. And the reason why I said string is because we're going to do the translation with that table. So let's go ahead and do that. Code, string, log, optional, and then we have ID, count, log, optional, and to be nice to other people using our code, we're going to say radius code. <laughs> And radius ID. There we go. So now we can come down here to where we were before, and we say that we want to set C spicy radius to be code equals it's called code type. And then we're going to input our input code and then we're going to do C spicy radius ID equals ID which just comes in there now if everything goes according to plan our new output when we run our test should have two new columns and they should have the actual output in them all one swoop so I don't even have to build because we didn't change anything spicy. All I have to do is just run B test again because all we did was change the um, 
seek files. And if I go look at the temp, we got a standard error. All right, let's see. Let's see what it is. Type clash in assignment. Line 67. All right, I'm going to pause the video here, figure out what this is, and then I'll jump back in and we'll continue on. All right, I'm back. This kind of stuff happens all the time. This was uh, actually a little more difficult to find. I had, instead of, I didn't have the radius underscore on here uh, previously, so ID was double defined, and it didn't give me an error on that. So, <clears throat> first of all, I had to change that. But it did give me an error down here when I assigned ID to ID because it was trying to assign it to the other connection ID. So I needed to put the radius underscore down here too. So once I did that and then I ran the tests, boom, we got our logs over here for our quote unquote error, but our tests are always going to error. So we look in our standard error, there's nothing. We look in our con.log, we still see radius, awesome. We look in radius.log and look to the right. Oh, look at that, we got two more columns. So we got the code and the radius ID in now. All right, so the next thing that we wanna tackle is gonna be the type, uh, what do they call them, the attribute type values. So what we need to do Swing back over to our analyzer.spicy, and we need to define a brand new type. So I'm going to copy this. And I believe they call it um, type that. We'll just call it type val. And we'll make it empty right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the information up on my other screen here. Okay, and we got hmm, type. I don't want to use the word type. Okay, T is going to stand for type. That's going to be uint eight. Now we got a length of uint8, and let me put a comment. And then the rest is gonna be the payload, or actually they'll call it value. Okay. So the value, I said, um, shoosh, I said size equals 16 because we used 16 somewhere else. Where was that? I remember just seeing it recently. Oh, it was above, right here. <clears throat> I think in an earlier video I put square brackets and put 16. And actually you got to do ampersand sign equals 16. That's how you do it. But what we should really have is self.length. But it's going to be, let's see. Two. All right. So we're going to subt probably subtract the type and the length from this. Just look at the RFC on the other screen. Since they're both one byte each, we'll end up subtracting two. So the length should be the type plus the length plus the value. So our um, size going into it for value will be the length minus this minus this. All right, I'm gonna go double check that in the PCAP, which I have to switch screens for that. And I'm gonna pause this video and I'll be right back with you. Okay, so I'm going to call this a tribute value to be a little more consistent with the RFC. 
trivial. That's good. The first one is the type length, and then the value is um, the size length minus two. I did verify that in the PCAP just to make sure what I was reading in the RFC was correct. Sometimes they're kind of vague on those things, so I like to check the, R the uh, PCAPs to make sure it's going to parse correctly. All right, so that's one attribute value. If you remember, the RFC said there could be more than one. So what we're going to do is up here back in the radius unit is we're going to add attribute values. And we're I'll just call it trib vols, as in values. And then I'll call it a trib value. And then just have the square brackets. So that means um, uh, like a vector or, or an array. And you want to tell it how far to go. Well, here we just want to go to the end of the data. And finally, if we're lucky enough at this point, we should be able to comment out our payload that eats up the rest of the data because this structure should automatically fold out and grab all the attribute value pairs. In theory, let's make sure it does. But we have a lot of uh, things to do before we get there. First, we, <clears throat> or next, what we want to do is make a username column in our um, radius.log. So to do that, we need the username out of the value out of one of these attribute values. So how do we do that? We need to handle every time one of these attribute values are um, processed or parsed and basically look at the type see if it's the right type. If it's the username, then we snag that value and we stick it in the log. And you can think of this, we can extend on this logic. It doesn't have to be just username. We can do this for um, all the other different types that exist. And we're not, trust me, we're not going to do that in the video. We're only going to grab the username and, um, you know, look at our log and see if there's anything else we can add. Uh, I think there was like a, uh, an address we can pull out of there. We'll add that to the log and then, uh, We'll bundle our package up. So if you recall, the glue file is the .evt. We need to now handle this attrib val. Okay. So to make things easy, what I usually do is cut and paste and then um, what's what I'm looking for? Um, fix things up. So trib val, radius, message. Now I'll just call this trib val and we're still going to send in the connection and is a ridge but we're going to have something different now we're going to have let's see this the type we're going to send back and we're going to send back what did i call it the payload or no i called it the value i believe let me double check yep value. So we're going to send back the type and we're going to send back the value. We don't need the length. The length is really just for this, but you know, it's there if you want it, but you can also calculate it since you have the value. All right, so the type and the value we're sending back. Um, the type, we're not translating to anything. We're just leaving a uint8 and we'll just do the comparison. We'll do an integer comparison because that's really all we need in here because we're not going to output anything um, differently to it. So let's go ahead and look at um, okay, trib val. Now we need to make a declaration. All right, our code, this is, all this is going to change. We're going to have, uh, what was it? Type, which is a count, and value, which is a string. Okay. 
So we have that declaration here, and we have the same thing, connection is a ridge, but we have the, um, the type. It's going to be account and the value string. And I just know that these are the translations. This is in the spiky, spicy documentation uh, where it will they'll have the conversions of, you know, a uint is account. Bytes is the string. Okay, so let's go ahead and create just a patch of my cut and paste. All right. Oh, we already have this working. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. So that way it doesn't keep going out to standard out. And for our trip val, um, what we need to do, very first thing, is because we're already in radius, we need to set our session. So that way we have our structure to save data to. Okay. Let's go ahead and add. Username. This will be a string. Okay. And if we come back down here, now we have those fields in the log. Those two new fields of, um, I'm sorry, that one new field of uh, username. So now what we're going to do is we're going to watch. Um, for all the attributes, and once we see the attribute of, um, what is it? I'm going to look it up on the other side over here. Attribute type of one, we're going to save the value in the username. It's going to be that simple. So, first thing you want to do is say, if our type equals one, I apologize, you have to watch me type so much. The uh, I try to get the big stuff out of the way. All right, so if we see if type one, we're gonna set the session and then on C, spicy radius username equals value. Okay, with any luck, if I compile things and run this again, I get an error. Let's see, analyzer spicy line 28. Value bytes size. I missed something up in here. Okay, well, I won't keep you to watch it. I'm going to pause the video, take a little break. I'm going to pick out what it is, and then I'll come back and tell you what it is. This one wasn't that hard to find. I would just have some missing semicolon here uh, on the length line. I put that in, I uh, compiled and ran the tests. And what we see is the user Steve showing up way over here. So our log is slowly building. And now you see why I have the tests. So I just add, you know, I go into my spicy, I add a field or two, you know, what did we add here? We added this whole attribute value thing. You know, that was a pretty complex thing that we added, but in this language, it's very simple. And then we dealt with it in um, CLAN here with the attribute value, and we added it. <laughs> and we have a log, so it's that quick. So um, I see two other fields that we might as well just get while we're in the video here. There's one called framed IP address and framed IP net mask. And there is also a NAS IP address and NAS port. All right, let's get the NAS IP address and NAS port first. That's um, type four and five. And then we will um, get the framed IP address and probably call that a day.
So how do we do that? We actually are only have to do that in Z Clan. So um, let's see. I'm going to reconstruct this into a switch, which is going to take me a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this video and uh, type that out. Okay, so I made the if into the switch statement, and I pulled out the IP addresses and the net mask, all the stuff that I talked about, and coded it all up here. And aren't you glad you didn't have to watch me do this, because it was several lines. While I was doing that, well, first, let me explain this. I'm going to explain this, and then I found um, something else in the um, code that I just think was wrong. So we're going to change it. And this happens all the time uh, when I'm doing protocol development. As I figure stuff out, I'm like, oh, i got to rechange the structure on this. So instead of uh, going back and editing the video, I'm just going to show you how I do it. All right, but first, let me explain what I added here at the switch statement. So all I did was look at the R type coming in, and instead of looking at it and saying if... I then just did a case, and each one of them I set a session, and depending on what it was, I set the different um, parts of the output file. So I made a new username. I'll show you that in a minute. I made a new NAS uh, IP address, NAS port, framed IP address, framed IP net mask, and this just takes the bytes and makes them into address. This makes it into account address and address and then this um, just straight username okay so on my way up I found this and I said huh message is called every single time and we were storing the code into the spicy radius every single message which meant the code was changing which meant this column was kind of useless because we'd have to get more we'd have to severely change our structure to try to save this information somehow but we don't really need it so then i commented that out then i realized the radius id is in the same boat so what i did was got rid of both of them which made me think oh i um didn't need to handle this message anymore but actually i still do because i decided to add another field that when we do see an access accept, which means it was successful, we have a field that we populate as true, that by default will be false. Okay, so all that is up here. And even though I could cut this out of the code, just in case we expand on our code in the future, I'm gonna keep it because I don't wanna to have to code it back in. Okay, so if we come up here, I cut out uh, the fields that we removed like the radius ID and the code, and then I added all of this. So all of these are new fields. Okay. So what I did is then I um, went ahead and ran the test. I'll do that now. Standard error, standard out, or empty. We looked at radius.log, and as we look across, this looks a lot better. We see the user Steve. We see some addresses in there, and sometimes Steve is able to log in, or, you know, it's a success, and sometimes it is not. So, I'm happy with this. I am happy with... Um, we have enough output that it's useful. There's not too many lines. There's just one line per connection. Um, you know, we can expand upon this if we want. I think it's a good stopping point and a good version 0.1.0. So let me go ahead and close this out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run btest with a dash capital U. And what that does is it creates my baselines. And if you go into here and you look into baseline, look at connection, we see the radius looking good. And then we see radius.log. 
We see Steve just like we saw before, and now it's tests. And this theoretically should be empty. It is. Awesome. So that's it. I'm going to take a break here, and we're going to switch over and push this up so other people can use our code. So next, when you create your GitHub repo, you're going to get a repo link. And if you visit with a browser after you create it, it's going to say, you know, you can create or you can push code up and you use this command. And one of the commands in there is going to be git remote add origin. And that's basically that. Well, that is where I uh, pulled out this first command. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add all our hard work. We're going to add a commit message. And it's going to just say added basic functionality. Then we're going to push to origin master. And we're also going to track it with dash u. Then we're going to make a tag. And what this tag is going to do is once we register our packages uh, on, or we register our package on packages.zeek.org, this is going to be in one of the drop down box um, values that you can pick. And then uh, the last command here is just pushing up the tags. So with that, we're almost done. Okay, here we are at my console. You can see I did a get status, and you can see all the files that we did our work on. Um, bu, 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 bu. Let's see. So what I did is I pre-typed in the line, the get remote add origin there. Let's go ahead and type enter. And I'm going to do a get add. And then just to follow the slides, let me pull up the slide and make sure I have a git commit m added basic functionality. And now we're going to do a git push u origin name. Ah, that should be a master. And then we do a git tag version zero one zero. Do a git push tags. All right, so now all our work is up at GitHub, and our new tag is also there. Next, I will discuss on how to register your packages. Now that we've pushed our source code up to GitHub, we can now um, go to uh, GitHub slash Zeek slash packages, and you just follow the instructions. It's pretty easy. It's right on there. I was going to show you how to do it, and then I realized their instructions just tell you exactly what I would have showed you. So I think I will just point you to their instructions. Um, again, if you have any issues with it, um, you know where I'm at on Slack channel. Um, for ours, we're going to go into the core light. Um, if you want to see where uh, the core light packages are, basically just go into the uh, packages repo and there's a core light directory and under there there's a, um, I think there's like a ZKG meta file, search of the Z. You open that up and then it's just a list of all your packages and you just, each one is a package and when you want to add a new package, you go to whatever your user account, mine is core light and you add a line like that and it would basically just point to where we just uploaded it. It's that simple. Once all that happens, um, usually it takes about a day-ish or so for packages.zeek.org to index and display your new package to everybody. But once that happens, you get to rejoice because ZKG should then be able to just pull your package down easily. Uh, if you don't want to go through and register your package, you can always use ZKG and point it to a URL. Or in my case, I just install it from a directory all the time because I'll have to SSH something to a remote sensor and then I'll just ZKG it, ZKG install dot from the directory that I unzip it from. So you can do the same thing with this. All right, that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything, uh, feel free to find myself on the spicy channel of the uh, Zeke open source Slack server. So thanks again for your time.